Um, today we have on sales intersection, the intersection of sales and impact, money and meaning. We have the CEO of, of Victory Lab, uh, which through a, a blend of tailored education, access to opportunity, and, and the support of their community, they help more people get it right and succeed sooner in their careers. It, it, to me, it sort of strikes me as the industry educational Robin Hood of merging education and employment, decentralizing the career potential of tech sales and elevating the consciousness of the, of the tech sales sector status quo. Um, but Brian, fantastic to have you on uh, with us today. I, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to chatting with you today. Yeah, sure. So instead of getting into how you got into sales, which I'll ask in a second, it, this, this kind of applies to the lack of, of courses or opportunities to learn about sales uh, in, a, in a college capacity, high school, or you know, even elementary school. You know, there's biology classes, but there's not sales classes, obviously. So um, first, I want to say, you know, when you were 10 years old, what did you say when people asked you what what did you want to be when you grew up? I'm sure it wasn't I, I want to be in sales. It was not. Uh, I can I can assure you of that. Um, when I was 10 years old, when I, people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, at that point in my life, which was probably what like fifth grade or something like that. Yeah, I would have, I would have probably been you know uh, a a solid bench player in the NBA. <clears throat> so. <laughs> that that's uh that's the sights i had i had set for myself as a youngster uh, yeah well it's at the bar high man <laughs> i i've i've asked my friends this because sometimes i practice for the, the the podcast and the last guy i asked said he wanted to be a farmer for four years um so you, you get some pretty interesting responses i i grew um, up in these bowls man and uh you what i grew up with the 90s bowls team so six championships in the decade and uh, so I was a I was a a, a a fanatic a basketball fanatic back in the day, and oh, I, was man. Pretty, I was a I was a pretty good player at one point in my life. So I I didn't think it was that unrealistic. But as I got a little bit older and wiser, I realized that it actually was quite unrealistic. So I started to set my career sights a little bit elsewhere. So yeah, Chicago Bulls. You know, like Steve Curry, you might have to take a punch in the face by Michael Jordan, Jordan every once in a while in in, yeah, exactly. in practice. Um, so, you know, I, I read uh, you thought of the idea that the mission of Victory Lap while backpacking in Europe. Um, do you remember if it was a specific moment of inspiration that led you here? Or was it a process where you were you were juggling the components of necessary for such a venture in your mind, but it took a while to come together? It's definitely more of the latter. Uh, my first my first job out of school was for a startup in San Diego. Uh, and it exposed me to startup life. Um, and I frankly got the itch and I didn't foresee myself doing anything other than startups going forward. And part of that it really inspired me to one day do my own thing. Um, and and uh, so you factor that, that kind of phase in the journey. And then you kind of factor into the plan. Once I left that company, I, tr I decided to travel for a year and sort of figure out my career game plan. And, um, and then you, and during that year of travel, one of the commitments was to, you know, come up with some business ideas, one of which was this idea for Victory Lab, which was really trying to mirror, you know, kind of better integrate the whole college to career ecosystem that I thought had a lot of fractures across it. Um, and then fast forward to five years later, my time at Groupon, where, you know, we were hiring 30 to 50 salespeople a month, and I helped build out their sales onboarding department. And. I, I was an entrepreneur, right? I created this idea. It worked. It had great results. And uh, I had a lot of, had a lot of fans. Uh, and that sort of gave me the confidence then to actually take the leap of faith to do my own thing. But it wasn't very, you know, I had the idea in, in 2010, but it was a lack of confidence, a, a self-conscious imposter syndrome, you know, uh, logic, you know, financial feasibility. I had a lot of sort of mental hurdles to get over, uh, but the idea, uh, the excitement, the energy, the, the passion to sort of do my own thing never went away and, you know, push came to shove eventually in my life and, and decided to take the leap in 2016. So. 
Got it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm very familiar with with the space. Um, and I'm sure in your mind, it's it's much more segmented, the competitive landscape than than I have in mind, you know, I 20 companies I've, I've written down that, you know, um, every everyone from uh, flock J to SV Academy to path rise to uh, so on and so forth. Let me ask you, you know, beyond let's say you're at a, a conference and, and you, you give away a pamphlet on victory lap and, you know, they, they read half of it or there's a 30 second plug on victory lap, um, you know, or there's, there's a 30 second cold call by one of your SDRs. Um, and they have a surface level understanding of victory lap what would you like the market to know that maybe they don't know about victory lap that you know if, if you if you had the chance to go another five ten minutes you'd really like them to understand how it how it's distinguished from the field well there's two markets right there's the student market and then the, there's the employer market right the, the b2b side uh starting with the b2b side <clears throat> frankly you know we, we offer really sort of two core off two we really sort of two core offerings for the b2b side one is we're a hiring channel okay uh, you know identifying let alone having enough quality sdrs bdrs to, to pick from whether you're hiring remotely or in a specific geographical area is a major pain point factoring in those people have never sold and half of which are probably not even interested in sales, they just want a job, uh, is another big pain point. And so as a hiring channel that provides vetted and trained sales talent to that organization, that's a big value add. Um, I've lived that pain points many times over. It was one of the inspirations for starting the business. Uh, if I'm them, if I'm looking at a couple of other quote unquote competitors in the marketplace, then, then frankly, you know, you should be looking at all of those three, right? We have, there's, there's now more elite schools producing this top grade talent. Um, so as a hiring manager, you should absolutely be, you know, funneling your search down to, to the victory laps of the world. Uh, now the differentiators, you know, everyone's going to say we're better or different in this, in this case. I think that the core differentiators for us is we, we look at sales success probably a little bit differently than most given our experience of building, scaling sales teams, succeeding and failing along the way. Um, and, and what I mean by that is sales is not a one size fits all career path. So on top of educating people in the core skills necessary for success in sales, we also educate people on where they fit within the sales ecosystem. Because what's key here, Eric, is the fact that we get these people to start off on the right foot. Too many SDRs say sales isn't for me at month six, month nine, month 12, and they, they don't follow the yellow, yellow brick road long enough to get to the true joy and riches that this profession can offer, both financially and otherwise. Uh, so we're very conscious about making sure that they, if, if they're not a fit for startup, they don't go to a startup. And we provide a really strong career coaching and career guidance layer to this. And the third piece is we stay with them. We have 24 months of, of post-program support. Why? Because we frankly can't necessarily anticipate that the company they go to may have the best onboarding, best continuous. Sure. sure. Our whole mission is success, man. It's about how can you get that person to be successful sooner in their career? So that's the, 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 the pamphlet, the flyer on Victory Lap. The, the second piece of that is we built the, the, we built the curriculum to where it's, it's, uh, it has been very, very successful in B2B reskilling or upskilling engagements. So um, our knowledge of sales transcends not to the end, just the entry level first time hire, it transcends to senior AEs, sales management, and frankly, just because of, of the knowledge base myself and the team has and how, how effective we are building curriculum. So that's the second piece from the, from the, I'm a hiring manager, I'm a sales leader, what does Victory Lab do for me? And what, what is, if, if you don't mind disclosing, what is the breakout of, of statistically students that graduate that go into an SDR role or AE role or maybe some kind of even management director role from uh, Victory Lab? It's always in the, in the SDR AE. We don't, we don't see any, we have 0% on the director level. That's an easy one. Um, and then on the, on the SDR side, it's like 70, every, you know, every cohort, we're a cohort model. We have our 57th cohort in session right now. So every month our data changes, right? 
based off the mix of that cohort, but right at roughly 70 to 75%, sometimes 80% SDR, BDR, 20% AE. Uh, yeah. Profile of student into, into job type. Sure, sure. Um, I, I actually listened to your 40 minute uh, webinar on basically state of the union for SDR world. And, um, you know, you had, you had kind of the four main pillars, which were, um, uh, you know, what is the ideal prospecting system, say segmentation, um, channel differentiation, kind of omni-channel strategies, um, uh, measuring and optimizing, right? And um, technology structure. So maybe your sales stack, right? Um, you you mentioned that in 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, personalization, hyper personalization is is going to be a a core theme. Is that correct? Um, I've heard, you know, I've had various guests on my on my show. The end. A lot, you know, a lot of them have said personalization. There's no such thing as hyper personalization or personalization at scale. However, as an SDR, and you mentioned this in the webinar, you can't just stop um, the hustle, the grit, <laughs> you know, and and if things slow down. So is one, do you agree with that, that there's no hyper personalization or personalization at scale? And two, is is that a challenge that, that your students find when they tr uh, transition into an AE, kind of more of a cerebral role where they that personalization has to be much more than, um, hey, Brian, go Cougars. You know, I went to the same college as you. Yeah, um, never, by the way, we sell this. Yeah, that never works anyway. So I hope, I hope, none, <laughs> yeah. I hope none of our people do that. Um, but uh, well, I guess they're, you're trying to get at a couple of things. One is the real realistic viewpoint on being able to personalize at scale. And then two, how do you sort of augment that uh, given the volume that an SDR is probably needs to keep up with from an activity perspective. Well, the, 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 is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's, that's spot on. Um, so the, the first piece of this is, um, is I, I don't know of anything right now, tech or otherwise that says, you know, Eric, here's your 300 accounts. I want you to make sure that you can write highly crafted, you know, personalized tailored outreach to 70 of them every single day, okay? Um, I don't know of that capability that exists, okay? I don't care how, how good your, your sort of targeting or, or sort of uh, a pulse you have in the market. Um, what you can do though, and where a lot of people miss out and make mistakes on this, is they are not taking this 300, this 300 batch of, of counts they've been in, in, given or generated themselves and in segmenting that with a sort of a hyper-focused different game plan or playbook approach every week. And that's where a lot of big misses, the reps, SDRs miss. They, they're so focused on keeping up to date with this activity around a 300 person account list where it really should be where you're 15, 20 that you're going deep into. <clears throat> and you're not only talking about the Cougars, you're talking about the breakfast joint in Spokane that serves the best omelet this side of the Mississippi, and now you're relating to people. Okay, so I think that's where we teach, and I, I frankly advise is like, you know, you have to be able to get to know a certain portion of your account list that it, you, in your belief, has the highest propensity to want to meet with you. I mean, that's all you're selling at this point is just a meeting, because the reality is <clears throat> hyper personalization doesn't matter given that timing is such a factor in why I wanna to talk to you or meet with you at a certain point either. So you could write me the most effective personalized email I've ever seen as a potential prospect and buyer, but if the timing's off, does not matter, I will not meet with you, right? So I, there's a, there's a you know, hyper-personalization important, recognizing that personalization is very important. It, it's not the end all be all for what generates a meeting, okay? So how, how, how reps strategically think, I think about prospecting as one of the most strategic activities that involves a heavy lift of critical thinking. Um, how, how can you teach them to sort of go against what you've advised the, the department as a whole to sort of optimize, frankly, what buyers expect today? Sure, absolutely. 
And, you know, I've, I've been an, over the set, past seven years, coaching, mentoring, managing STRs, uh, you know, junior AEs. And one, one challenge I've had is SDRs, they, they, they know how to have that five minute conversation. You know, there's, there's really only so many questions that, that can be asked. And, and so I, I, I find that they can almost speak robotically to these questions and I have to kind of teach them, you know, it's, it's almost primarily how you say it, not what you say. Do you find that that's a that's an issue and that's something that you you address in your in your boot camp or training? Well, it's just science of communication in general. We're way more influenced by the body language and tonality than we are what you're actually what's actually coming out of your mouth. That's just fact, science. So a lot of what we teach is rooted in in sort of the psychology aspect of of communication as a whole and how and why people are, are acting or, or, or not acting and influenced by that. <clears throat> so it's a big part of what we teach, frankly, which is why it's the best way to learn how to sell is by doing. <laughs> because yeah, you now evaluate tone, you're able to evaluate positioning, evaluate framing up, how conversational that is, uh, et cetera. Because um, you just can't get that uh, you know, in a non, non sort of simulated environment. So it's a huge, huge piece of what we what we teach. And I think it allows me to kind of maybe highlight a, different, a separate point too, which I'm a kind of a firm believer in too, which is, I think we don't necessarily, I think we've almost kind of, um, <clears throat> the SDR and the segmentation specialization within a sales team, I'm a believer of for a few different reasons. So SDR, AE, sales engineer, customer success, et cetera. Uh, and it's, you know, not every organization's a good fit for that, but a lot of them are. But I don't, I, I think that the reality is though, the SDRs could be more effective within the sales process in the funnel than we probably give them credit for. Uh, to your point around like being able to qualify a lead effectively, like, like <clears throat> I manage a lot of entry level people and they had to generate a lot of revenue every single month. Uh, and with the right coaching and development and, and, and support, they were some of our best reps over even the more experienced people. So I think that's just something to be mindful of is in terms of like the people who are listening who have an SDR team or the organizations that have an SDR team, like, dude, like level them up, set high expectations. Like they, they should be able to run the first meeting by three, six months into the job. It's not that complex of a conversation. Mm -hmm. I get it that it becomes more complex the deeper you get, but you know, sales used to be a profession where the sales rep themselves had a both you know, close the account, then run that account. That's how I kind of learned to sell. Uh, and I, I, I think we've kind of, we've, we've kind of coddled around the SDRs to a certain degree where I think it's impacting their development. It's impacting their, their, their view a little bit into the sales career path, because frankly, I don't want any of Victor Lab grad to be an SDR for long, for a long time. Like sure. you're, you're not an SDR for life out of this thing. So how companies set expectations and onboard and, and sort of phase them up from an enablement perspective, I think has a lot, lot of improvement across the board. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I want to be sensitive to time and I'm going to transition to uh, some very different questions, but, you know, I think a lot of times success runs from the top down and obviously, I mean, congratulations, by the way, on the, on the, on the recent funding or somewhat recent funding, I think it was 25 million, uh, or, or something like that. But um, for you as a, as a person, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what are, what are two or three things you do outside of work that really kind of up your game personally and in your pref professional life? Uh, it's a good, you know, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I have three kids under five. So I really um, have done my best uh, pre-pandemic, during COVID, et cetera, to be uh, as, much, as present as possible as a dad and, and uh, husband. Uh, and in turn, um, that, that kind of reinvigorates me to put that much more energy into work uh, by creating some good separation. So, you know, that's something that's a struggle for, for those folks that have, have a business or leaders that uh, have high demands at the workplace and also at home. Um, and then, but it's something that I, I think is really important to, to, to get right. Uh, across the board and uh, makes me a better person, makes me a better leader, uh, no doubt about it, uh, when I balance it out properly. The second thing is, is I'm an, I, I still read a lot. So uh, I, I'm always reading something, 
usually nonfiction, business, history uh, related. Those are my sort of beach reads, so to speak. My wife makes money fun of me for that. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy, you know, going through school back in uh, just not that long ago, but literally you had to go to the library to like get and in, find information on something. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's how you did. That's how you answered a question. I'd go through the library and go to the floor and find a book and find an answer. Now it's just amazing how, how, how accessible things are. And I find yeah, Google podcasts, audiobooks. It's, it's crazy. It's both invigorating and also overwhelming and also scary because who the heck are we listening to right now? I mean, look yeah. at LinkedIn. It's like, you know, I have a thousand experts telling me what, how to, how to be a better salesperson every day. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like who's, who's vetting these people. So yeah. uh, across the board, there's a lot of interesting things there, but I just, you know, I, I, I advocate this for all of our students, my team, read, read, read. Elon Musk. Hey, Elon, a reporter asked him, how'd you learn how to build rockets? I read books. That's what his answer was. Uh, yeah. and I think there's an antiquated aspect of being scrappy that happens when you read things, especially paperback, uh, hardcover, et cetera, that uh, I, I think I, I put a lot of emphasis into my development over the past couple of years since running the business, the start of the business. Yeah, and I, th I think I heard your reference, and I, I my sales philosophy is the same. Is I I think it's important to know all the sales methodologies and and, and not really um, employ one, you know, throughout my sales career, but know when to pivot and use maybe you know uh, multiple. But I, I tend to 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 read. Uh, you know, the psychology of sales, those types of books, because the technology changes, the, the, the office culture changes, but the psychology of sales, it really kind of moves a lot slower. So um, yeah. that's, that's kind of, but I, I agree. I, I, I continue to invest my personal development and in, in especially through reading. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, and I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, who were your mentors? Who, who, who do you look up to? Who have you learned the most from? And, you know, from, from the beginning stages of, of, of working to starting your own business to today at Victory Lab? I've had, a, I've had quite a few at every kind of sort of stop in the, in the career journey, right out of school. I had an amazing, amazing manager named Tim who, uh, who, the, you know, I think the best thing he did for me was he challenged me without, without losing faith and belief in me. And as a youngster who worked really hard, but didn't necessarily have the right, uh, right idea for what true North was, that was beyond helpful. And it's something I've always tried to sort of pay forward with any entry level person I've worked with is, is maintain a consistent level of belief, uh, without lowering expectations. Uh, and I think that formula has worked out really well for me and, and a lot of others. Um, so that was, that was really important. And when I got, when I was at Groupon, I was there pre and post IPO. We were the fastest company in history at the time to generate a billion dollars in revenue. Billion dollars. Yeah. Crazy, crazy time. I don't, I, I frankly haven't, haven't heard or seen a, a sales force scale and, and kind of operate at that level since. And, and that was 10, almost, almost 10 years ago now. So a uh, lot of smart, talented, helpful people, uh, too many to name, frankly, uh, and that social capital I accrued there was mon monumental to eventually starting Victory Lap. And, you know, Victory Lap I've had, again, too many to count. Uh, I'm very much a person who who recognizes what I do know and what I don't know uh, and, have, and have been focused on surrounding myself with with people or getting introductions to people who I think can 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 get me to the right answer faster. So in, in a sense, uh, having a mentor, a coach, an advisor, has been a big part of, of my career uh, success, for lack of a better term. In a, in a, in a just an, it's not even like oh, I I only go there if it's it's a, it's as it's as constant as the air I breathe. It's just part of, you know, the way I I I I, I operate as a leader and a and a person who's always striving to be better. So. Yeah, that's great. I actually think that we have a mutual connection of a semi semi close friend of mine. Mandy uh, Cole, who married my good old colleague, uh, I'm not sure what her, her former last name was, but she was had, I think, you know, kind of up there in the sales team at, at Groupon. But anyway, I digress. Um, and then finally, I just want to ask, you know, the, the recent funding, what do you see happening in, in development in the next year for Victory Lap? Um, 
you know, uh, product wise or yeah. uh, to distinguish yourself in the market? A lot of it's going to be focusing on the learner, so the student and the outcomes uh, and being able to uh, drive predictability at scale as it relates to the skills a student should be able to acquire uh, and how that applies on the job uh, while doing all of that in a digital uh, education experience. So we're all digital, we're all online. We think there's actually a lot more good that could happen through an online distribution plat education platform than in person actually. But there does, there's a lot of thought tech uh, and design aspect that, that plays into it uh, from a learner, learner uh, learning experience. So that's the bulk of it. And then, you know, marketing and sales and all the other fun stuff that comes around uh, growth, aggressive growth metrics that need to be hit. So, you know, making more people more aware of Vector Lab, more aware that sales education is the right step to take towards accelerating career success or de-risking, uh, you know, being in the unemployment line for, you know, first year in the job. Uh, and then, you know, second thing is, you know, education is all, to me, it's always, it's always about outcomes. Your customer is a student. Uh, and then in our case, the customer is a student and the employer they go to. So we have, we have sort of two masters to serve. And, uh, you know, for us, it's about how do we drive outcomes at scale and, Heck, 80, nearly 80% of our students graduate into a sales job and stay there longer than a year. Um, wow, that's great, yeah. 30, 40, I think I told you, uh, my SVP of sales at Active Campaign, my, my good friend, Adam Johnson, who, with whom I used to work yeah. uh, at Salesforce, his, his younger brother went through uh, your academy and had nothing but good things to say about it. So um, shout out to him and, and, and you know, uh, a great third party validation for you, so. Well, um, hey, Brian, I really appreciate the time today. Uh, a lot of valuable insights, gems in here. Uh, is there anything that you want to plug um, where they can people can find you or, or what you feel, uh, you know, is is valuable content right now for Vec Victory Lab? Yeah, I think just in general, we have a, a pretty aggressive cohort launch schedule. So every the last week of every month, we launch a new cohort. We graduate, we start 58 our 58th cohort in two weeks. So on the student side, every month, um, there's an opportunity to join join Victory Lap. If if you get accepted in, uh, obviously has to align with what you provide and what you're able to, to put into it. <clears throat> and on the employer side, what that means, there's a consistent flow of talent on the outside of that. So we, we en enroll people across the country right now. Uh, our five core markets are Chicago, Denver, Phoenix, Austin and Atlanta. So we have some concentration from a geographical perspective. So on the company or student side, uh, a lot of emphasis there, um, but really nationally where we have clients on the B2B training and reskilling, B2B hiring because of remote and obviously on the student enrollment side uh, happening in, in all 50 states. So hopefully- That's great, that's great. Well, uh, hey, uh, for you and all listeners, if you just Google sales, sales intersection podcast, you'll, Pretty much the whole front page is is covered with YouTube and Spotify and Apple and all all the platforms. But you can also go to just salesintersection.com. And um, this episode, after I get through uh, editing it, and and don't expect uh, you know Hollywood esque editing. I, I do it myself, but it's um, pretty simple. And I you know this this is really all about the content and the guests and and what has gotten me. What, what, what has really gotten sales intersection to be so successful. So um, I want to say thank you. And uh, hopefully we talk soon. And um, I know you're a busy guy. So I, I really appreciate the time today. Thanks, sir. Great, great chatting. Yeah, great chatting with you. All right, talk soon. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye.